Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending session five of the IBR webinar series. As a reminder to all participants, this webinar is public and is being recorded. The registration information was posted on the NERC website and widely distributed. Speakers on the call should keep in mind that the listening audience may, may include members of the press and representatives of various governmental authorities, in addition to the expected participation by industry stakeholders. Should you wish to ask a question during today's webinar, please use the Q&A feature. It is NERC's policy and practice to obey the antitrust laws and to avoid all conduct that unreasonably restrains competition. This policy requires the avoidance of any conduct that violates or that might appear to violate the antitrust laws. Any NERC participant that is uncertain about the legal ramification of a particular course of conduct or who has doubts or concerns about whether or not NERC's antitrust compliance policy is implicated in any situation should consult NERC's general counsel immediately. At this time, we will hear a few words from Alex Shaddock. Thanks, Stephanie. We'll keep it very brief to get into our presentations, but uh, thanks for joining today. This is session five, which is our first modeling session, modeling part one, uh, which I guess kicks off modeling week, which is uh, Thursday will be modeling part two. Um, today, we're going to have some different perspectives from folks. We have uh, an OEM giving us their perspective, uh, a consultant, and um, someone on the utility side. Uh, we're going to go basically from, from OEM model through the consulting world um, and into the, the interconnection process world. So um, a lot of good perspectives on, on modeling coming up today. Um, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A and uh, let's just jump right in. Okay. Um, thank you, Alex. My name is uh, Steve Jagir. I'm the uh, Vice President of US Engineering for Power Electronics. Uh, for those of you not, not familiar with Power Electronics, we are a um, Spanish uh, based company based in Valencia, Spain, that we make inverters for both the solar and the energy storage uh, business. I have some uh, slides that um, came from our modeling group, which is in uh, based in Valencia, Spain, and hoping to go through these. And certainly, if you have any questions, we, we can answer those. So the, the next slide, um, you know, just talking about some of the software we use and grid experience and model app, um, validation, adaptability, and then the last slide will be on challenges. All right, uh, next slide, please. So, yeah, maybe hit uh, about five or six enters. So, certainly one of the, one more, that's good. So, certainly one of the, the challenges is there are many utilities all over the world and they all have um, different interests and many of them use different software. In the U.S. by far, PSCAD and, and, and PSSE are the most popular. They are Basically, they get to the same end, but they, they use different functions. I know there are certain utilities that, that want to see PSCAD and PSSE models right on top of each other, and sometimes that's not always possible. But basically, this does say it's a very, very wide range of uh, software tools that are used to do, do um, utility modeling. Uh, next slide. Oops. So as far as, as grid experience, uh, again, PE is based in Valencia, Spain, but we are a, a worldwide country. Um, one of the interesting challenges is, is I think every OEM would love to be proactive in terms of keeping up with models and code requirements and, and always having models available for the next set, but it can be a real challenge to try to proactively maintain uh, model capability and compliance for, for not just in the U.S., but for worldwide standards as well. All right. Do you have a uh, next slide? But that being said, some of the um, oops, did I lose you, Alex? So I'm here. We want which slide did you want to see? No, oh, that's a good one. So you're just looking at some of the the various models that we have, you know, to such as PSSC and, and PSCAD and the, the different user defined models and generic, there, there are quite a variety of, of models that we need to keep up and um, try to keep current with the standards. Um, I'm not quite sure, I think I lost your slides. It popped up for a second and then disappeared. Oh, what do you, what do, are you seeing right now, Steve? I see a big white screen. All right. 
Let me just uh, exit and jump back into the slideshow. How about now? No, it's, it's still just a big white screen. Alex and Steve, this is Tom Dagenet. Uh I I can see the slide, so I'm not sure. Um, oh, okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so well, you're on you slide four, Steve. <laughs> okay. Why don't you move to slide uh, the next next slide on challenges? Oops, sorry. There we go. Okay, we're on challenges. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go to slide. Yeah, slide eleven challenges. So certainly we have you know many modeling. Um, project programs to support. Um, one of the interesting challenges is often uh, projects have a very long timeline to get to the interconnect process. And there's been a number of cases where um, inverter vendors have basically set an end of life uh, project. So a guy has spent a lot of time doing modeling. It's a very iterative process. And by the time he goes to place an order, um, that, that model is no longer available. So even though we've made, we may have made incremental changes to a product, there are some requirements where um, we may have made a subtle change to a unit or changed the model number, and suddenly that's that's knocked a customer out of the queue, and that can be very painful and very expensive for for our, one of some of our customers. In addition, um, in terms of modeling, sometimes it's particularly early in the process, not all parameters like the the SCR, the XCR are, are available. So you're, sometimes you're doing modeling without all the information that, that you really, really want. Um, again, a good example is we've just introduced our Gen 3 inverters, which are both solar and uh, energy storage inverters. And it's always an interesting challenge when you decide to, you know, basically end of life one unit and, and move on to the next. And one of the reasons that we, we looked at our, what we call our Gen 2 inverters, and we realized we couldn't take that product line and um, have it meet all the UL 1741 SB requirements, the things like the Casio uh, GPS clocks, the one millisecond synchronization. It was a very expensive solution that we retrofit into our previous generation. And with some a little time and a runway, we were able to take that feature and build it into our system. So now it's a, a more cost-effective solution than it was. So the other challenge that, that we have as an OEM provider is we provide um, general models to our customers, and they'll take those models and they'll give them to consulting companies, and, and sometimes there'll be problems and we'll work very closely with them on, a, on an iterative process to get models, but we often don't see the, the final result, like if a model is submitted to a utility, we don't always, um, customers don't always think to, to send those back, so we don't necessarily have a a library of models that were accepted in, you know, ERCOT or, or, or places like that. So we're, we are kind of one step removed from the final models that are submitted to, uh, to utilities. Um, okay, next slide. Or was that the last one? Uh, I believe that's your last slide. that might be the last slide. Yep, that's it, Steve. Thanks. Okay. Any closing right. thoughts, sir? We want to jump in um, and save this for the question to yeah, Q&A. No, I think I'm good. I'll save them for Q&A. Cool. Thanks, Steve. Uh, good perspective from the go. OEM side, uh, kind of where all the models begin. So uh, thanks very much. And we'll, we'll hear from you again uh, during the panel a session here later all right. uh, after the next two folks. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, Billy Yancey from EPE. He's going to give uh, the consulting perspective. So. Uh, kind of what happens in between the OEM and the, the utility. So thanks, yeah. Billy. Go ahead. Of course. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Steve. Uh, yeah. So again, thanks for having me uh, on this panel. Um, looking forward to the discussion today. And again, the opportunity to speak. Uh, again, I'm from the perspective of the consultant world. So my name is Billy Yancey. I'm VP Technical Services and Compliance here at Electric Power Engineers. And uh, basically, you know, my firm here, you know, we, we help generation developers and, and owners interconnect uh, their projects to the grid, you know, so taking them through the entire interconnection process. So my today, my presentation is going to focus mainly on that facility model creation process from gathering the data, model creation, and, and kind of taking you through that process. So next, next slide. 
So basically here, you know, I've kind of outlined a little bit of, of what the facility model creation process looks like from, from a consultant's perspective in terms of how we go through this process. So first we, you know, we're approached by the, by the developer project owner that they want to interconnect a project to their grid. So now it's a matter of what's the size, let's collect all of the data, et cetera. So we bucket this process into basically three major buckets, request the information and review the information, create the model, and then perform the model testing and benchmarking. We won't talk as much or any today about the model testing and benchmarking as I, I believe that's in our next webinar, probably for this Thursday, but uh, and it'll be discussed by others. But I'm gonna focus on these first two, the request for information review and model creation process. So, you know, basically, you know, there are different uh, components to, to each of those where, you know, basically just asking for all of the data with regards to the project, the balance of plant data, the control strategy, voltage, frequency, you know, any kind of shared control for hybrid projects, et cetera. And then again, you know, one of the bigger items requesting the generator models from, you know, uh, folks like Steve and, and Power Electronics and other OEMs and, and getting those models uh, for the interconnection process and performing the studies. And then, you, you know, you've got the, you know, the model creation portion where right now, you know, where we're seeing a request for models from steady state, short circuit, dynamic, and transient models, and in different softwares, like Steve had mentioned, mostly in the US, we stick with PSSC uh, and NPS CAD. You know, TSAT has become a big one in the ERCOT region as of late. Um, and depending on what types of models you use, user defined or generic, then that's a separate model that needs to be developed. And then now we're also seeing a lot of requests for. For ASMA models for the short circuit studies that you know that are being uh, performed and, and such. So, so with that being said, you know I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, a little dive into more details uh, surrounding the request for information and review and the model creation, and then kind of identify some of the challenges that we see from from a consultant's point of view. Next slide. So, kind of starting at that request for information, you know, review is to keep in mind that that this project is is multi-person multi-team multi-group oriented so it's basically reaching out to a lot of different uh, uh individuals whether they be the owner the developer the oems the engineer of record other consultants in some cases to gather all of the data uh, in order to build the models so again you know we've got like i said before the balance of the plan data which includes you know your main power transformer your collection uh, MP collection data, your, your your pad mount transformers or up tower transformers, whatever, and your inverter based resources, wind turbines, inverters, etc. So getting all of that information and then, you know, having the discussions of, well, how are you going to do the control? Keeping in mind that this, we're very early in the process of this project being developed, you know, usually less than, you know, 30% design stage, meaning it's still very preliminary. So some of these these items haven't even come across, you know, the the developers played in terms of just identifying what where they're going to go. Um, so again, one of the you know the challenges we see at this stage is requesting information of, of items that we feel could could be still in flux. You know, typically again very preliminary in terms of some of these uh, projects getting ready to go in the interconnection process, and this just leads us to you know making some assumptions about some of that design information that again I'll I'll touch base on a little bit more in detail when we start creating the models. But again, you know, there will be some assumptions that will be made that potentially, again, depending on the assumptions could lead to changes down the road, which could impact, like Steve had mentioned, falling out of the queue, restudies or, or things of that nature. So having a little bit more visibility about that or maybe early long-term, and I know that's challenging for, for developers in some cases in identifying those, but again, it's, it's just a challenge that we see and it just makes the development process need to be that much faster uh, from a consultant standpoint in building and putting together the models. Also, we see a lot um, as of late, just inverter selection is still being negotiated and finalized, you know, depending on what status the project is, it, is in, you know, it's, it's uncertain. They may have two vendors that they're discussing, uh, you know, options with, uh, you know, whether or not the model is being discontinued or they want to go through a different model pricing structures, et cetera. So again, that has a, a significant impact uh, because, you know, choosing the inverter now at this point and going into the interconnection, you know, again, changing that later on could lead to, you know, material modifications, again, Q uh, restrictions, restudies, et cetera, that could be very costly and, and, you know, untimely to the project in terms of meeting their COD. 
And and last, you know, the last challenge I see from the BOP design point of view is is what we're starting to experience a little bit more uh, on the hybrid uh, the hybrid plant situation um, or some solar projects for that matter is just the power plant controller. Um, some OEMs, you know, don't uh, the inverter OEMs don't provide power plant controllers for for sites, and thus a third party power plant controller or uh, you know, an off-the-shelf RTAC or something needs to be used to, to basically perform that power plant control function. And this is not even being discussed at, at these stages typically. So this is where, uh, you know, typical assumptions can come in. We can use a generic plant controller that does your typical AVR, PFR, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, the idea with that is, is that communication needs to be had with the respective, you know, developer to, to, to let them know that, Again, if this changes at any point in time and more complex controls come in, that, that's going to lead to changes in models, changes in studies potentially, and potentially affect the dynamic response for AVR, PFR, and such at the plant level controls. And again, these are things that we've seen come up as of, uh, as of late. And then lastly, uh, regards the you know, request for information generator models, just you know, depending on the requirements, as as Steve had had mentioned, uh, you know, again, asking, requesting these models, and some in a lot of cases is, is very straightforward. But as the requirements are changing, uh, sometimes we see or or inverters are getting uh, updated, and, and and new products are coming out. Sometimes the models take a little bit more time to provide, and, and depending on what status the the project is at during the interconnection process, the timeliness of the models being received by the by the OEM is is, is critical um, just to get the process started to create the models. Next slide. So now I'll move a little bit into some of the uh, the more meaty meaty discussions of the challenges that that we face with regards to the actual creating of the model. Now, assuming that we have all of the data and we're comfortable with the data that we have at this point, you know, I, I feel that 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 request for data and that data piece is going to be is always an iterative process, either through the model creation and then on into the model testing and benchmarking. Because, again, you know, some of that some of that may change along the way, or you may find that you need to make you know additions to things uh, as you go um, uh, in terms of equipment sizing, reactive equipment that you need, et cetera. So. Moving into the model of creation, I'll start with, you know, two of the most, the more basic ones, the steady state and short circuit, you know, albeit they're, they're ones that usually have the, the least amount of challenges associated with them. And, and they're mostly driven by some of the data that's provided in the request for information stage and, and also dependent upon the studies that create, but they also could potentially cause some, uh, some concerns as you start getting into the, the dynamics and the transient phase, like, for instance, you know, again, MPT sizing, OLTC controls, you know, additional reactive devices, you know, those are going to play a, a, a role in the reactive power capabilities of the site. And the reactive power capability, you know, is, is needed as a key portion in, in a lot of those, you know, quality tests or tests that are being conducted in the benchmarking stage. So thus, if, if, if there are misassumptions there or incorrect assumptions or things that need to be added, those are going to have an impact, uh, you know, later on in, in your studies. Also, another big one that I'll touch more as we get into dynamics is, is, is quantity of the of the inverter based resources. Again, I already touched on the OEM selection, but the quantity of the resources is going to play a role, you know, based on some of those dynamic requirements and, and meeting the, you know, the active power requirements or reactive power requirements during the dynamic response stages of the uh, of the modeling. The short circuit challenges that you know that we see is more of it's more of just a, a lack of of communication. I feel uh, with regards to what maybe some of the utilities are requesting or the requirements that are out there, and and some of the OEMs actually see or have visibility to. You know, I, I made note of just some things that have changed over the last few years in terms of how we model inverter-based resources in the short circuit model and how it's how it's changed and the requests just come. And, and basically, you know, what I see is we reach out to some of the OEMs with regards to some of the data and they're, they're not familiar with, with the request, uh, you know, in some cases, not all cases, but some cases, and, and then it takes them a little bit of time to get that data. And, and basically, again, this, this just show, kind of gives us, you know, it takes more time to get through this process and keeping in mind that depending on, you know, the, the different windows for the interconnection processes across the U.S. or or in ERCOT where you have QSA deadlines and such, 
timing is very critical in some cases, depending on you know when we receive the the request from the developer owner to kick off this model development, model creation, interconnection package development. So time is very critical. So again, I you know we do our best to identify these as early on, but sometimes you know it, it even even identifying it early on if if the OEM is not ready. Uh, for the for the request, you know, it, it could take them a little bit of time because it's, you know, again, they have other priorities as well uh, in their, you know, in their list of things to do. So therefore, I, you know, I think that more communication and definitely more visibility needs to be, you know, garnered in that in that area. So with that said, I'll I'll move to the, the my final slide where a lot of the the meet and discussion will, you know, I think will will take place, and that's more over. You know, this is driving more of our events and our planning studies and, and you know, the system wide events that are, we have been facing and that, you know, we ever grow concerned with. And that's the dynamic and transient modeling um, of, of these sites. And, and again, it's, a, it's like I said, a very iterative process. And, you know, what we see uh, it varies from one OEM to the next. I, I can't, I can't say, say it enough that. That again, we get lots of support from the OEMs, and we, we work with them very closely to 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 go through these processes to get these. But some things that I I feel that are challenging that I think that we can work closer together with them to give uh, you know better information is just you know like 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 Stephen said a moment ago, you know he's not given enough information on XR ratios, et cetera, to give you know better tunable models. You know we see that the parameters are set with with default values with minimal guidance on tuning to meet the requirements. And what I mean by minimal guidance is more in the documentation phase um, related to some of the tests that are that are performed uh, during that benchmarking and, and testing phase. Uh, they provide great feedback uh, with regards to, you know, discussing and, and seeing what we can do to test and tune. But again, that that interaction sometimes just comes with more time being spent than maybe, you know, than maybe we have in some cases, or there's a lot of projects going on across the board, across, you know, their their side of things on their side of the fence of the OEM, as well as, you know, the, uh, the, the consultant side of the fence. So there's a lot of things going on and a lot of time being spent in meetings discussing some tunable parameters that we feel that potentially, you know, could be uh, some, you know, base level parameters or maybe ranges of parameters, kind of like what's been done with, you know, some of the generic models and such, just to give an idea of what, what the limits are of these models to be able to, to get a better idea of what I can test and tune and then provide that response back to the OEM to say, hey, are these a legit set of uh, parameters and, 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 and such. Another big concern that that has been going around is still, and in, in my opinion, is just the voltage right through response requirement, especially in the in the ERCOT region, with regards to how fast we respond to reactive power uh, during the events, the active power response post event, uh, and things of that nature. I, I still see a little bit of a concern and confusion, maybe from the OEM side point uh, standpoint. In terms of just what the expectations are, and 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 it's uh, it's a matter of just kind of working through that and getting an understanding and how we can best address that uh, uh, moving forward. Um, in the dynamic models, again, protection settings um, sometimes set to default without any ranges provided. Sometimes they need to be adjusted to meet the you know the ride through requirements, et cetera. Just not having that handily available. Just results in more more time being spent back and forth confirming uh, confirming values that that pass that are working through other solutions, and then we we move into hybrid PPCs and just power plant controllers in, in general. Um, you know, with the with the more penetration of solar and best projects going out there, we're seeing uh, um, a lot of hybrid plant controllers that are going in that that don't have models. Um, whether they're third party vendors or, you know, they replicate a generic model or such, there's no clarity in terms of, well, what model are you going to be using? Uh, oh, we're going to use a generic model. That's what the vendor has. Well, the inverter manufacturer provided two UDM models. How am I going to integrate that? So without some special, uh, basically, consultant to come in and, and develop that PPC uh, for them, it, there's going to have to be a, a decision made whether you change the inverters to generic and make sure that they match the response, or you you know you reach out to a consultant that can develop those PPC controllers and and integrate them with the inverters. 
Um, some PPC manufacturers have those models. Some integrate with some manufacturers, some don't. So it's, you know, it's a growing concern that we see, especially with the use of uh, more PPCs. And, and again, even to add in the reactive devices uh, in there, we see that still in some cases, capacitors, reactors, stack comms, SVCs, et cetera, are not integrated with those plant level controllers in a lot of cases as well. So again, still still missing some of those pieces uh, as part of the modeling. And you know, as, as a consultant, we're doing what we can in order to try to bridge that gap uh, between there and, and, and basically make the system whole. Uh, and and then again, you know, just kind of moving into uh, you know UDMs versus generics. Where do you go? What are you studying? What are you using? Parameter verifications and and making sure parameters match and responses match in terms of what studies we're doing uh, to make sure we can recreate events and 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 basically properly plan and address system uh, events. So that's a big one that we're still seeing a lot of uh, kind of discussions on and which ways which ways to go depending on which uh, which ISO which facility you're in, et cetera, and, and the best way moving forward. So that's all on the dynamic side. That was a lot there. I'll try to summarize the transient a little bit faster because all of those concerns you see in the dynamic space and PSSC, PSLF, TSAT, they're all there in the transient realm as well and PSCAD. So there may be, there's only a few other ones in addition to that. And it, it mainly revolves around, uh, you know, initialization of PNQ uh, or just the model in general uh, in a certain amount of time based on the requirements of the study being done, you know, less than three seconds. I know the EMT uh, task force is doing a great job with working through all of the, the necessary items on, on, that, on that side of things. And, and then also some parameters are hidden within these these models some of them are totally black box so any changes that i make say in the in the pssc space to a user defined model i can't make those in pscad without either the oem doing it on on their end or or providing an updated model with with those with those parameters and and in some cases you know the the parameter names between the models pssc and, and pscad may not even be the same so it, it takes a little bit of fishing and understanding of, of the models to be able to cross correlate those uh, between the between the two spaces. So with that, I, it gives a, a very uh, high level taste, I think, of, of uh, where, you know, where I see the some of the challenges are from the standpoint of, of a consultant and just kind of working through this model. So um, thank you guys for your time and look forward to the question. Thanks, Billy. We'll get plenty of questions in the, the panel coming up. Thanks again. Uh, this is a very good presentation for a seldom seen mid step between you know OEM models and what's actually getting used in those studies. So that was a really good um, perspective for everyone. So uh, we're going to keep the model timeline going. Um, and now we have Tom, who's going to tell us about uh, ETC and establishing their modeling requirements. Thanks, Alex. Uh by way of introduction, I'm Tom Dagene, Director of System Planning at ATC, um, here to talk about a little more about modeling. We've heard from Steve on the OEM side and Bill on the consultant side, but uh, from the utility side, what does that look like? So uh, if you go to my next slide here, um, just real quickly so you know where we're coming from, ATC is a little bit unique in that we're a transmission only utility. Um, and then also we're a bit of a, an electrical peninsula. If you look at the map here, uh, we've got Lake Superior to our north. We've got Lake Michigan to our east. We have a few 345 kV ties to, to Minnesota to the west, but those are long, um, long high voltage lines. So uh, that gives us a limited, um, limited options to lean on our neighbors, which does provide us some unique operating challenges. If you could go to my next slide, please. So just like uh, much of the country, we are inundated with new generator interconnections as a utility. Um, you know, we're part of the, the MISO, uh, Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, and they run the generation queue. And these numbers of active MISO G to T projects here, generator to transmission interconnection projects, uh, this is for the ATC service territory. Uh, it gets added to once a year as, as MISO releases the new queue of um, you know, the new cohort of generators to be studied. So that tends to be a big increase. And then it drops over the course of the year as we get generators who drop out of the queue for various reasons or as interconnection agreements 
are, are established and agreed to, um, they would come off this active project list for us. This number 136 here is a couple of weeks old. Um, we're down to, I think, 128 right now, but we have not yet gotten the, the 2023 queue released. So that'll uh, bump that number back up. And, and just by way of, of comparison or, or understanding the scale and scope here, 10 years ago, uh, if we took a snapshot, um, we went back and looked, the number of active projects we were looking at was four. So there's a lot more going on now. And you can see the total megawatts in the queue um, uh, proposed to connect to our service territory, to our system, 18.4 gigawatts. So that 18.4 thousand megawatts. Our peak load is 13.3 gigawatts, uh, peak all time load. So we have more generation in the queue than we even have ever had load. Now, this is the, the VER, right? Variable energy resource type generation for the large part. You can see solar, storage, and gas make up, uh, solar and storage make up the vast majority of this with solar being about um, about 70%, 65% of the total, 75 total projects. And we know, you know, solar doesn't run all the time. So uh, of course there's gonna need to be more megawatts, but this is, um, you know, this is just meaning more projects, more inverter-based resources. Um, so more uh, power electronics added to the system that need to be managed and, uh, and need to be prepared for and studied so that we can maintain a safe, reliable and effective system. Go to my next slide there, Alex. So Steve talked about PSSE and PSCAD as two of the, the very common software package used um, in the US at least to evaluate the power grid. Uh, this chart is just, these charts are showing a couple different things. Um, a PSSE dynamic simulation on the left there, a 20 second simulation of the worst contingency N minus one um, that shows a, a stable result for the generator. Um, the, the voltage dips, it recovers and then stays stable. If we run that same fault in PSCAD doing the electromagnetic transient simulation or, or EMT study, um, we can see that there's significant oscillations happening on these tiny time scales. So the chart on the left is a 20 second chart. The chart on the right uh, is probably about a second. It looks like I cut off the, um, cut off the bottom of the, when I imported it into this, this uh, slide, looks like I, I missed the x-axis there, but you can definitely see um, the oscillations and this can si cause significant issues. Uh, we had a fix for this, implemented that in the model, a transmission system fix, and then we can see the oscillations happen very quickly and then stabilize, and that's the, the bottom right chart. So, you know, this is an example of, of kind of what Steve was saying, um, or what Bill was saying, I believe, where, you know, maybe your your dynamic studies you've been used to doing aren't quite uh, aren't quite sufficient anymore. So we used to be able to to use just PSSE to determine uh, the reliability of the system, but it's critical now that we use the electromagnetic transient software simulations such as PSCAD. If you can go to a, a, my next slide there, Alex. So you know, Billy mentioned that studies and restudies can be time time consuming and can be expensive. Um, so in order to manage the workload, we, we screen the system and we prioritize based on short circuit ratio and weighted short circuit ratio. So these are not, you know, these are not ATC uh, specific calculations. This is, uh, this is just kind of best practices, but, but we've implemented them into our planning processes to take a look at short circuit ratio for an individual generator at the POI, the point of interconnection, we, we take that, that fault current, that short circuit uh, MVA at that point of interconnection and divide it by the megawatts of that VER, that variable energy resource. Um, and the, the megawatts would be the Pmax there um, when we're studying it at max output. And what we're looking for there is, um, a lower short circuit ratio is worse. You know, you've, if you've got less fault current per uh, megawatts being installed of these of these IBRs, um, you've got a weaker system. So when we see short circuit ratios three or lower, 
that's when we implement a, a more complete PSCAD analysis. Um, we can also keep, keep track of weighted short circuit ratio, which is a system-wide calculation using the, um, the, the, short, the, the sum of the short circuit MVAs by the, the P maxes of the generators divided by um, the, the square of those P maxes. It, it gives us a, a system-wide measure of our system strength. But really, these are just things we can keep an eye on as baseload plants retire, um, as those, those large, you know, mechanical spinning masses retire from the system and change the short circuit current on the system. Um, provide a, a, if you don't have that, um, you know, the, the grid forming inverters creating synthetic inertia, then you've got, you've got a weaker system. So um, it's something we can keep track of to help us decide where and when we should focus our study efforts. If you go to the next slide there, Alex. So, you know, if, if you think back to the, the plots comparing PSSE and PSCAD, or you think back to uh, recent system events, if, if you've been following um, the Odessa, Texas disturbance from last summer or the summer before that, or some other events that have happened on the system, you know that the reliability issues are already here. And as we implement more inverter-based resources on the system, more of these variable energy resources, uh, they're going to be more challenging in the future. Uh, we also know that gathering the models for these and verifying the models are a time-consuming process. And with Q timelines being squeezed with uh, you know, PJM and MISO and, and different uh, Q management, uh, just being overwhelmed with the number of proposed generator interconnections and with uh, developers un very understandably being very eager to get their, their plants online as soon as possible, make them commercial and start earning on those, uh, timelines are really being squeezed. So it's a major concern. How do you fit in the study work? How do you fit in the model um, gathering and verification? Um, what we've done at ATC is, is a number of things. We've implemented IBR requirements into our local planning criteria. So our local planning criteria uh, go above and beyond the NERC uh, TPL standards in a number of ways. We, we treat our 69 kV system in large part as if it were uh, bulk electric system assets um, in, in many ways in terms of uh, system reliability for our customers. And we treat IBRs um, more like we anticipate they will be treated within the uh, entire industry in the coming years based on the recommendations that came out of the Odessa disturbance reports. So we've, we've done all that, but as part of that, we do ask for PSCAD modeling of generators that are, that are connecting to our system. And that, um, that can be challenging for the OEMs to provide or the consultants who are working with the developers or the developers themselves. So we've developed a model verification process, and we've got a checklist that uh, we ask to be submitted with the model. This is really, um, it, it contains usability requirements. I think there's 13 different usability requirements for the model checklist, a comparison of the load flow modeling versus the, the PSCAD modeling, and then different uh, performance tests, about a dozen different performance tests that the model submitters uh, can can perform before submitting the model, and this is new for our latest uh, our, our latest Q cycle. But it already seems to be saving us and our customers um, time and energy. Uh, previously, we'd have months of back and forth before getting the models to work well, but now the interconnection customers can perform some of those same verification tests that we do that we would do uh, that we do before they submit the models. So they can see the issues and fix them uh, on their own before submitting the models to us. And it also provides standardized um, submittal of modeling information so that it's easy for our engineers to find the specific information they're looking for. And it, as, as developers or interconnection customers before become more accustomed with the checklist, more accustomed with the requirements, it'll streamline for them uh, what they're submitting to us because they will know the expectations. They will know um, what kind of information goes into what parts of the model submittal, model submittal process. So um, we're, we're really seeing this as, as beneficial for us. Um, I, I did mention, you know, we do have IBR requirements as part of our local planning criteria. 
this makes our uh, interconnection study process a little more um, time and study intensive, right? Um, but it's for, uh, and we feel strongly about this, it's for the good of the grid as a whole. You know, it doesn't do us any good to connect a bunch of uh, renewable resources to our system only to have uh, a single phase fault trip off uh, hundreds of megawatts of IBRs in a, in a you know, 100 mile radius. Um, you know, it doesn't do our interconnection customers any good to connect to our system if we can't maintain reliability of that system or if they're going to be knocked offline by something that happens uh, at a neighboring IBR. So, uh, you know, following up on the NERC Odessa uh, disturbance report and the recommendations coming out of there, we've implemented a lot of those recommendations right into our planning criteria. Um, we feel strongly that that's the direction the entire industry is going, and when it's more widely adopted, uh, this will just be seen as a typical part of doing business. And things like our our modeling requirements um, and our our model checklist can can really help streamline that process. So um, it's out there on our on the atclc.com web, website. If you if anybody would like to take a look at what that looks like, uh, it's out there for public consumption. Um, that's that's all I had for today, Alex. Um, trying to keep to my ten, ten limit timeline here, um, so I will turn it uh, back over to you to uh, to gather the Q and A and ask us as as presenters uh, our our thoughts on on whatever awesome. questions you've been getting. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Tom. Uh, very good presentation. Um, yeah, we agree. Yeah, definitely more collaboration and uh, you know model checks throughout the industry you know, help raise the Raise the bot, raise the floor, right, of model quality and study quality. So thanks very much um, for the presentation. We're going to jump into the Q and A now. Uh, so the panelists want to throw their cameras back on if you're using it, um, and if not, just come off mute, and then I'll just get it right into it. Uh, we are actually again just on time somehow. Um, so first question is, you know, NERC has been seeing, or sorry, we've been stressing kind of the criticality. I think it got touched on a couple of times throughout today, but. The criticality of getting accurate models from from developers and generator owners um, for use in the interconnection process. So, um, you know, getting good data um, early on so that it can be captured and studied um, throughout the process. So, but we also are seeing from industry and, and other discussions that you know, there are some pretty solid, um, you know, systemic deficiencies in the accuracy of those models. So, um, I guess from each of y'all's perspective, um, what kind of steps could you take? Or are you taking uh, to mitigate the risk of of an un inaccurate data um, in the modeling space? So I can. Oh, oh yeah, go ahead, Billy. I'll, I'll follow. <laughs> I'll follow you. Okay, I, I can say you know from a consultant's perspective, you know what what we're trying to do, at least from you know the I can say the overall modeling perspective, like we like I mentioned in my presentation is. It's verify, verify, verify. So, uh, you know, a, as much time as it does take to verify, we feel the need to do so. So when we get into that model testing and benchmarking phase and we're running those studies, when we see the responses, you, you know, and as Steve had mentioned too, when we start getting uh, responses to, to all the requirements of the studies that we're performing, we relay that back to back to the OEM and, and we say, here's our setup. Here's our, you know, what we're doing. Do you agree with uh, the parameters we've set um, for this study? You know, and, and looking at it from both the RMS and the uh, uh, domain and the EMT domain and saying, okay, we get similar results across the board for the same studies that we're performing. Are these parameters in align with what you expect to, to be able to be capable of uh, implementing and and you would potentially implement in the in the field and, and basically creating that that communication as early on as possible with regards to those and then you know if they don't meet the requirements can we figure out a way to to meet the requirements with uh, a different parameter set or if we can't then we need to start discussions with the utility or the iso uh, to determine what what the next steps would be with regards to you know going through this process now again granted Sometimes time is of the essence when going through this process, but that's, you know, that's what we feel right now is, has been working uh, so far. That's good. I think, uh, yeah, time is of the essence, definitely from the, the customer point of view and, uh, you know, from the, from the RTO point of view, 
you know, MISO has timelines they're trying to stick through, uh, stick to um, based on what promises they've made, right, to FERC. Um, so, yeah, there's there's always a uh, a time element to all this stuff. So, I think, you know, how do we mitigate the risks uh, with these models? Uh, I I think, you know, I, I certainly know ATC doesn't have all the answers, but I think we've taken a huge step in the right direction by trying to standardize model submittal, right? Using our, our generating facility interconnection guide uh, that I talked about a few minutes ago. So getting all different um, interconnection customers to submit modeling information that they can check themselves and they're submitting it in a standardized format for us to review um, really helps reduce the, the confusion and risk that can, that can lead to, you know, time delays, uh, restudies or, or different, you know, back and forth, just in terms of iterative process to get the models right. It's it's certainly not perfect, but it's definitely better than nothing. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Uh, Steve, any thoughts? If not, we can jump on to the next question. Right, hearing nothing. All right, so we'll move on to their next question. Um, so, you know, NERC has, Obviously, uh, you know, a couple of, you know, a few, right, critical, important standards or performance standards or other, otherwise, uh, you know, subject to a mandatory enforcement right now. Um, and some of these are technical um, and they cover, you know, modeling and, and model usability, model quality. Um, you know, we're working on my 26 updates, my 27 updates. Uh, there's an EMT standards project happening. Uh, I think my 25 and PS19 are also getting work done. Uh, but in your mind, you know, is there anything missing? Uh, it could be from, you know, anything missing from the NERC side, right? It could be either missing standards or missing topics um, or anything else, you know, that the NERC could be doing uh, or industry could be doing uh, to, to, you know, to close any gaps that may exist either in uh, modeling requirements or, um, you know, enforcing those requirements. I have some thoughts. Uh... Go ahead. I can go ahead and go first. I know you yeah. just heard from me, but um, That's you know, I, I, I think there's a number of things that that you are pursuing um, that that definitely are, are going down the right path. Um, and I I empath, empathize with with NERC because you've got a, a tough job trying to get you know hundreds of if not thousands of different entities on board uh, when making changes to to standards, right? Uh, I think that the, the recommendations in the Odessa report um, were, you know, very good recommendations. There's some things that we implemented um, that aren't implemented nationally yet that, you know, I think stuff like these webinars just help raise awareness of the, the very real reliability issue that's facing us today and is growing um, can help people see the importance of, you know, updating PRC 24 with with ride through uh, requirements so that, you know, a unit won't, uh, you know, a unit will ride through, uh, you know, a, a nearby single phase fault or that it, if it does have a momentary cessation, that's not twice in rapid succession, you know, that there's, there's some gap in time there. Um, things like that are gonna be very important for the future reliability of um, both the generator staying online and then serving the end use customers at the load. So. I think that that all the, the things you're doing um, are very important. It's just a matter of, okay, we we know these things need to change. We know we need to be better as an industry, but how, what are the specifics? How do you go about? You know, what are the specific wordings? So I think you've you've had some challenges getting things passed. Um, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of proposed rules, and you know, some of that may be due to lack of knowledge in terms of the real threat in front of us, but some of it may be due to people's problems with specific wording and just needing to work through and um, and get that right. So I think that's that's a huge job, uh, I understand, but uh, very important work. So I think that's, that's you know, I, I think you're, we're headed in the right direction as an industry. I would just like to see us move a little faster. Good feedback. And just to be before I'm going to interrupt before Billy does, and just I'm going to make a shameless pitch for uh, any folks listening who you know please join the IRPS. 
um, please join the EMT task force. Um, those two places are where we're we're all getting together uh, and discussing these issues and trying to get things out of IRPS like reliability guidelines and white papers um, and things like that. And then you know being part of that group is going to get you some more visibility into uh, you know opportunities maybe to join on Sanders drafting projects and join Sanders drafting teams um, and things like that. So. Um, like Tom had said, so we can make sure that we have great expertise from everyone in the industry um, to make sure that all the expertise is there and to make sure that, uh, you know, things are, are applicable to all and any new form across across the continent. So uh, that's my shameless pitch. Uh, so Billy, any thoughts? Um, no, I, I, could, I couldn't agree more with, with Tom. I think speed is the name of the game in, in some of these instances, especially again, like you were mentioning earlier, the, the, the temperature here in, in Texas is rising, you know, starting to see potential, you know, uh, flickerings of maybe concerns here in, in, in ERCOT and whatnot, but again, and wanting to be prepared for that. Uh, but, but also, you know, I, I think, I think NERC is doing a great job with regards to the task forces and everything that they're putting together and, and the in invitations to people to come to speak, to get the word out, to get the communications flowing and having the right people, you know, involved to, to basically close all these gaps. And because it, it definitely does take a, a joint effort from all in order to, to go through this, this process all the way from the OEM, all the way to the utility, the developers, the consultants and everyone, you know, working together to, you know, to solve this this common this common problem that I I know that you know we can we can get in a good place and I I think the thing is is you know there's a lot of discussions on you know the specifications and the specifics and I know NERC doesn't get down into the specifics in terms of response and response time amount of response and things like that but those are definitely discussions that still need to be had because there are uh, there are places and and particular potential places where maybe, you know, something at least needs to be discussed. And that's why I like the guidelines and, and such to come in. Uh, the only the only other comment that I have, and and, and I am I'm just curious, um, is just any if you guys feel that there are any need for regional variations within the US, I know some standards have variations like Quebec and IESO, etc. But I'm particularly fond of, uh, you know, my ERCOT space, and sometimes they have some particular requirements that are more stringent than NERCOT and and uh, and then NERC. And and just wondering, you know, if there's ever if there's ever any need for even more regional variants, depending on the strength of systems, et cetera. Just something to keep, you know, an eye out for, I guess, or just, you know, my curiosity. Yeah, and that brings uh, like me. We may have talked about that in the other interconnection process uh, webinar, but. You know, the, the idea is that, you know, the NERC standards are the, the minimum, right? Um, where regions may have, like you just said, uh, special needs, right? So what we would expect in that situation is you can take the NERC standard, um, you know, take PRS24, I know those have regional variants, but um, that's maybe a good example. So, you know, PRS24 has for the, for the continent some requirements, but they have some locational uh, ride through differences for those different systems needs. So, what we'd also what we'd always recommend is that you know if you're a region, um, don't you don't always have to do exactly only what the NERC standard does. Um, there's plenty of room there, uh, and it's encouraged to to make requirements uh, if you need them uh, that go above and beyond uh, what's in the NERC standard. Uh, just the idea is to to do something like like Tom is doing, right? Where, where your requirements and your checklists and things like that are very clearly posted. Um, and easily digestible um, because well, I think we, do, we definitely talked about this in the interconnections uh, session, but just to rehash it is that, you know, there are very varied, incredibly varied uh, regions in the U.S. Uh, so there's not going to be a one size fits all performance for every region. And then there's not going to be definitely not gonna be a one size fits all performance requirement for um, for each smaller area inside those planning regions. So, um, when we when we want to write up our requirements, we want to make sure that there's room for, um, but also encourage, uh, you know, more strict requirements than the NERC says. And, and always, um, if there's a question between, you know, the NERC standard and, um, you know, maybe a regional requirement, and which one's more strict, you know, it's just it's up to the region, um, and to make sure that you know the the facil facilities and interconnections to those regions are following um, whatever the most stringent are. Um, but to do that right, um, we need to find kind of what these sessions do, which is a lot of collaboration and discussion um, and sharing perspectives. Um, and then, 
know, kind of raising the knowledge floor of, hey, we might have to learn a bunch of different interconnection requirements, not because we're annoying, <laughs> but because they're, they're mandatory uh, for, for different regions and areas. So, yeah, very good uh, comment, Billy and Tom. Uh, any thoughts as, on that last question? Yeah, as much as I'd like to take credit uh, as you tried to give it to me, um, I have a very, <laughs> <laughs> a very smart team of engineers who who really pushed for for us making our local criteria changes and and implementing that uh, interconnection guide uh, with the modeling requirements. So I can't take credit for that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, your team did a great job, and we really appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate posting them and making them clear and, and kind of going up, taking a step into the do more work uh, to make the grid more reliable, you know, on, you know, space and move forward. So really appreciate that from, from you and your team um, for doing that for us. So uh, we have five minutes left. Our last question, um, this might be easier question, uh, but uh, kind of this is just uh, to ask from y'all, you know, what is the, what's your largest kind of impediment um, when it comes to making an accurate or a site specific model? Um, is like, is it hard to get the plant data? Is it hard to match parameters to sites? Um, is it are models hard to use? Is all of the above? Um, so, what do you all think on that one? Billy's laughing, so he goes first. I'm sorry. I see you. Billy's laughing. Uh, I mean, it was just my my presentation. It's challenges all across the board. It just it just really <laughs> depends on the on the circumstance. Really, I mean, we're seeing a lot of you know my my biggest concern. I think right now is is that a little bit of a disconnect between the interconnection models and the commissioning models, and in terms of sometimes the models are being tuned to meet the requirements and the immediate term to get through the interconnection process, and then. You know, either like Steve was mentioning earlier, those those settings are not relayed back to him and his team, uh, the OEM or any OEM for that matter. And then when they go out and commission, they commission default parameters and do that parameter verification or parameter matching and during commissioning. And you find out that, hey, uh, I, I set different parameters. They don't match my initial responses from the interconnection, you know, a process or the tests that were done then. And and then what what do we do now? Um, what is the next process? You know, again, going back and, and adjusting those parameters, that's going to cause a, a time and cost again to them. So, you know, that's that's the biggest disconnect there. And and also, you know, throwing out some of the, the events that have, have occurred and, and some of the changes that have been made during those events or, or demonstrating how to uh, mitigate those events, basically the forensic studies that have been done to change parameters and then going back and redoing the studies, what impacts do they have? Um, were, they, were they close? Do they meet the requirements on the, on the front end? You know, what impact do they have now on the planning studies? Um, you know, things like that, I think, are what, uh, what's, what's starting to concern me a, a little bit with regards to the, to the accuracy of the models. Thanks, Billy. Um, and before you go, Tom, there's a there's a commissioning session and a couple more sessions uh, that kind of goes into more detail about those gaps and that kind of stuff. So I, I can't wait. Um, yeah, good. Well, good. I'll, I'll be brief <laughs> here uh, as we're as we're coming short on time, but I, I will say yes um, to everything that Billy just said, and then uh, point out that you know just within ATC's service territory, our footprint, we've got 42 different. I think it's 42 right now different developers we're working with to connect generators to our system. So there's been a learning curve, right? Some of them have done this before, some of them haven't. Um, and when you're talking about new things like, hey, we need a PSCAD model for your IBR, um, some of them know what we're talking about and some of them don't. So it's a learning curve both on our part um, in terms of grappling with these new challenges, but then also um, industry-wide, just getting everyone familiar with what we need to study the system and, and maintain reliability. So, any final thoughts before we wrap it up? About two minutes left. Well, thanks for the opportunity to uh, to chat today and and to share share our thoughts. Sure. Thank yeah. you both. Thanks for putting this together, Nurk yeah, and no I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so everyone here, uh, we're, that's it for today on modeling session number one. Uh, we have modeling session number two coming uh, on Thursday, and we're gonna we go and do some regional requirements, um, some OEM benchmarking, and OEM uh, you know model support and uh, kind of life cycle type uh, presentations coming next to kind of to close out of the modeling week and to move into our special studies starting our special studies session starting uh, next Tuesday. So. 
um, see you all then. Thank you all for participating today, and uh, we'll see you at the next one. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. Alex.